the night endured for long after the rescue. Hello everyone and welcome to our latest historian interview. Today we are talking to Gareth Russell about the Titanic. He wrote this incredible book. You can see I've got all my <laughs> post-it notes in there. It's impeccably researched, um, impeccably written, so readable, full of information. It's such a a narrative around what we think is a really familiar story. Um, it's called The Ship of Dreams, The Sinking of the Titanic and the End of the Edwardian Era. And it's, it's an incredible book, so I, I thoroughly recommend you grab a copy. And so we're going to be talking to Gareth today about the Titanic. We're taking on a slightly different theme than is usual. We're going to look at what happened next, what happened after the sinking. So a slightly different uh, angle on a familiar story. With the Titanic, obviously we, it's such a well-known ship. I mean, it's what, so what she, she so 1912 she sinks. So way before we were born <laughs> and yet, you know, it's familiar to us. It's familiar to my kids. You know, the name, it's so familiar. And so we kind of think, you know all the stories, but everyone everyone thinks they know the story oh. of the Titanic. And so I thought it would be, well, from reading your book, there's loads of interesting angles we could have gone at, and, I'm, and hopefully we'll speak a few times um, about, yeah. about the Titanic. The way you write the book is incredible, I have to say. I mean, I feel like I've learned so much about, way more than the ship, but about society at the time, about um, Anglo-American relationships, just even in, in Europe at the time. Um, I, feel, I feel like I could write, read it a hundred times and still not absorb everything because it's so full. It's just brilliant. And the way you write it, though, is very easy then to to listen to. It's not heavy. I don't I really don't know how you do it. Um, but yeah, so I thought, you know, let's actually we're going to start at the end, different to um, Dorothy Gibson in, in her interview when she says, let's start at the beginning. We're going to actually start at the end and the kind of what happens next. Um, because it's really interesting um, because obviously the what happened next is why, I think, yeah. maybe, we're so familiar with the name. Because had it have just been, because loads of other ships sank, lots of other people lost their lives on other shipwrecks, but it's the Titanic that we remember. Um so yeah, I was hoping um, today we could we could explore that angle. Sure, I mean it's. I think the. I mean there are two, actually three really. Um, yes, I would say three, uh, full length chapters towards the end of the Ship of Dreams, where I talk about what it was like to be rescued and then what the survivors' lives were like. Because I think though there's an there's a tendency, almost to stop when the lifeboats are picked up. Mm. by the rescue of the Carpathia. And actually for me, the, the, the worst bit, the most like emotionally draining bit to write wasn't the sinking. It was those, those day, three days they spent on the Carpathia, the survivors. And I think it was the tennis player, uh, Richard Norris Williams, if I have the triple barrel name in the right order. But he said, you know, I think it was him. Um, and I'm paraphrasing slightly, but he said, you know, watching the Titanic sink was, was horrible, but it was nothing compared to how horrendous the, the three days on the rescue ship were because what it, it, the, the bomb of grief that just kept exploding for these people when they realized there weren't other rescue ships, when they realized that um, it hadn't been women and children first, that in many cases it had been women and children only into the boats and that their husbands and their sons and their brothers and their fiancés were, were among the frozen corpses that they could see in the distance. Um, the just, the, the, firstly, the shell shock of grief, which I think is always kind of a, you know, a horrible thing. And um, to me, deep grief is a trauma. And I think what happens is initially you are in shock. It's like losing a limb or something. And it's only after a few, a, a short period of time that the intense hysterical pain um, sinks in. So I think, yeah, I mean, I think that that bit was the most difficult, but it's what 
the survivors did afterwards when they landed in New York, that I think you're right, does explain why it's it's so much more familiar to us as a disaster. When you did have ships like the Empress of Ireland sank with a similar-ish loss of life two years later, the Lusitania sank a year after that with much more political impact in terms of what it did to the First World War. But the Titanic has almost become a ship completely divorced from its, its context, and it has become... Uh, it it has become one of the few things in history that are that were real but have become legend it has become so i mean it, it's i say at the end of the book the the reason why we eventually sort of uh settled on the t- title of the ship of dreams was that it it still is kind of the projection of what we're of what we think and what we need this story to tell so i was more interested in kind of looking at it initially as a product of the Edwardian period, and then how did it become um, this fantastical um, story? It's, it's, I, I, you, you talk in the book about how people were trying to grab moral lessons from the Titanic, you know, that this was people versus nature and um because i suppose we're in a we're in a oh my goodness we've come a long way even since obviously since then but technology was really beginning to to um pick up a pace at this time so you know the telephone and i don't know that you, you talk about all these other things as well and um and and, and the, there were obviously people with reservations about that which we we have now as well and that maybe and that the titanic was some kind of um example of how nature had gone ah, ah, ah. Yeah. <laughs> hold on yeah. there human beings <laughs> i think i mean the thing that blew my mind i mean just utterly extraordinary was that it the only before the sinking of the titanic the only time a captain would seriously consider slowing the ship almost really slow it down was fog and that the perceived wisdom was in a nice field, sp- keep going fast because you'll get out of it quicker. And that, I mean, that's where, first of all, um, was an interesting piece because it completely jettisons this ridiculous idea that Bruce Ismay, the managing director of the White Star Line, put pressure on Smith to keep going fast. Smith did not need pressure put on him. That was the perceived wisdom. And yeah, I do think, I mean, for me, for me, I think that the, the that was probably the, the bit that struck the chill to me, which is that I think man does need um, a certain element of humility uh, when it uh, when it comes to nature, and that nature can say, "Hold on, I'm just gonna just gonna remind you of what I can do." Man has never beaten nature uh, in a war. Maybe we've won the occasional battle with clearing a forest, but when it comes to mountains of ice and man made steel. The, the the ice still wins but one of the lessons that I think was a that again I mean there was the the man versus nature one but there was a sort of corollary lesson that I don't agree with and the Titanic is still used in this which is that the sinking was sort of punishment for the materialist sins of man and that there's there was implications in homilies and sermons and some literature that you know they would make allusions to um, the two cafes that the first class passengers had access to, and that there was a swimming pool and a Turkish bath and um, two you know two lavish sets of staircases, as if somehow that was why it hit the iceberg. Um, and I think actually the Titanic, I, I tried to really stress that there really wasn't anything wrong with how it was built. That is a complete myth. Um, the Titanic as a, a symbol of human ingenuity and innovation, I think is extraordinary. And I do try to pay tribute to the men who built her and the men who designed her and the men who sealed her. But um, I, I, don't, I don't think that um, great works of technological triumph require punishment from nature. I do think... Um, flinging yourself against nature is where you will lose. And to me, that's probably the salient lesson that I took from the Titanic. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when the survivors got to New York, so the Carpathia docks at New New York and they're all filmed coming off. Yeah, there were ships that tried, there were um, little... um, (laughs) 
ferries that tried to like get journalists on board the Carpathia as it was coming into New York. There was, um, there were some newsreel cameras trying to capture images of them as they came off the gangplank. And uh, Edith Rosenbaum, who was a fashion journalist who had um, been traveling in first class in the Titanic, talks about the sort of the. Um, I think she says calls it cruelly inappropriate how the New York, they arrived at nighttime, I should, I should point out, but the okay. New York um, nighttime sky lit up with the cruelly inappropriate flash bulbs of a thousand press cameras um, trying to photograph them as they came off. And it's, um, I don't think a lot of the footage turned out because it was, you know, dark, but it, it there was a media frenzy surrounding it and I think it was one of the one off the first times that you saw real media intrusion into the lives of people who were suffering um extraordinary uh pain and grief you know, there was a horrible story Madeline Astor was pregnant and her stepson was waiting at the pier to take her to the car and she's disheveled um, visibly pregnant her husband is not next to her and all the press wanted to do was to, to get the answer is your husband dead or alive out of her um, and I wonder you know have we to me we've gotten to the point where we think and we see it by the way with, with some dramas based on the lives of real people I wonder was the Titanic part of when we started to really lose the um uh, prioritization of decency over entertainment and started to see people as headlines rather than human beings. I, I think there was an element of of, of that uh, feeding frenzy around the survivors. Mm, gosh, I mean, that's harrowing, isn't it, to think of? And yet we had Dorothy Gibson on board, who I think her lover at the time, what's his name? Um, Jules, Jules Brulittle. Brulittle. Yeah. Um, who was responsible for some of the footage of the survivors coming off the, the ship, if I'm right. Um, making a film within a very short yeah. amount of time yeah. after. Yeah, the movie the movie's now lost, which I think for, for historians of the Titanic and particularly historians of cinema is is uh, um a pain. But uh, it was called Saved from the Titanic and it went into production. I mean, to give you an idea of how quickly they started filming it, um, they had it out in time for the inquiries to end in the US and start in the UK, and it was very successful. They hired a sort of um, retired ferry and recreated the sinking. And Dorothy, who had, who was at this point one of, if not the highest paid movie stars in America, and who had been traveling in first class in the Titanic and survived. Dorothy had kept the evening dress and the cardigan and the shoes that she wore during the evacuation um, and wore it as her costume and played herself and they sort of created like a, a romantic subplot. But there was absolute, I mean, there was a, it was a huge success, but there were magazines that were absolutely aghast that that she was profiting from and that the, the, particularly the studios, I think they blamed them a lot as well, that they were, that they were, that a, a survivor was willing to recreate this trauma. And that, I mean, it was, it was a very lucrative move, but it probably writing about it, I, I, <laughs> it was, it's not your job to cast judgment as a historian, but it is. it was probably not something I would have done had I survived it to want. And, and, and look, she, she did cry when she was filming it, but she kept going. Um, so there was a big division at the time about was making this movie saved from the Titanic exploitation or was it a... Uh, actually, no, no one thought it was a tribute to historical inquiry. Again, was it exploitation or was it entertainment? And that's the debate we're still having about events inspired by, you know, real people. Mm. I mean, it was done incredibly fast. That's what surprised me. Well, surprised me, obviously, that a survivor was starring in it. That yeah. um, that, that it was. Uh, I, I don't know. Did Brule at all? Was that his? Was, did he sort of bankroll it? Is he the the guy? He was the silent producer. Yeah, he. He was a ruthless producer, and my gut is that 
the discussion about making a movie of it, Philip, probably happened the night that they reunited when he met her after she arrived in New York. If not, it certainly happened in the day or two after when they reunited at a Manhattan hotel um, that he suggested that one of the, well, no, she, and oddly, she suggested it was her idea. Um, and it may very well have been, I don't know, but um, it, it was an unedifying portrait of both of them that that was uh, so quickly a priority. Mm. And that wasn't the only thing that Brunator did in order to kind of... Ooh profit from from this so he uh you talk about in the book he uh, actually employed one of the third class passengers um i don't know how to pronounce this olis abelseth uh, uh, yes. uh, yeah. and to so so i mean so, i mean this this was a time where people went to a cinema to get their news didn't they I mean, you know and and so I, I think they would show the news reel or what, what i think of as a news reel and then um, this gentleman was there to regale his stories. Yeah. From it, the... it was a mixture of um, a Q and A with cinema because obviously the the newsreels were silent. Mm. Uh, and Ibelseth was uh, a Norwegian immigrant um, who had been travelling in third class to New York, and his sister Karen, who also um, happily survived. But uh, no story shrinks in the telling. It just doesn't. And um, one of the, the things that I, I really um, labor hard in the book to show is a, is a falsehood, is one of the great myths of the 20th century, which is the iconic harrowing image that third-class passengers were deliberately locked below uh, during the evacuation of the Titanic. And that that was why there was a proportionally higher death toll. And there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that happened. And indeed, mountains of evidence that showed the opposite. And it was, in fact, Abelseth who started that myth um, at those Q&As. And he was, and, and if you, I managed to read some of the letters that he wrote in the days immediately after the sinking to family members, where he makes no mention at all of um, locked gates, apart from one where he says that after the, the, the collision of the iceberg, he was on a cabin on G deck, so quite low down. And uh, the single men were accommodated in the bow, which is where the area closest to the impact of the iceberg. So they were very aware fairly early on that um, something was wrong. Stewards came down and said, get up on the opposite of what he later said. And he went down the long corridor that sort of separated the single man from the single woman. And there was a gate locked, as it usually was at night. But when he asked a crew member to open it for him, they immediately did to go and get his sister. So um, Ibelseth, by his own um, uh, testimony in the, to his family, makes no mention of it. But he starts to say in these grandiloquent Q&As, um, and he's being paid by Brulator, that he tells a very dramatic story of how, you know, the, the crew were pushing them back in and locking the gates that we then see in multiple movies about the Titanic. And it has, uh, I would argue, it's entered the, the myths of the 20th century, sort of as the let them eat cake moment. I mean, we know Marie Antoinette never said that. Um, but it serves a purpose. People want to believe that... that um, it speaks to what people think the fate of the poor are against the rich, um, even though actually third-class tickets in the Titanic were were pretty expensive. So it, it's not really a full social spectrum that you're looking at. Um, and I tried to explain why there was a higher death toll in third class. Part of it was gender. There were overwhelmingly a lot more men in third class than women. And obviously the priority was to evacuate women and children. Uh, and part of it was that the crew were not impressing a sense of urgency. They didn't believe it was going to sink. They couldn't speak. Most of the crew only spoke English. There was really a, a broad range of nationalities that didn't um, have a common language um, with the crew. Uh, and so it was it was a sort of combination of factors. But Ibelseth seems to be kind of patient zero in trying to trace where did this Stop. Where did this myth start? When it was when third class passengers who were asked about it at the inquiry were very clear that there was no obstruction, and there weren't sufficient uh, warnings being given. 
but there weren't sufficient warnings being given to any of the passengers. I mean, they started a music concert in first class and lit up the lounge and started serving cocoa, um, which doesn't exactly scream, get in the lifeboats, <laughs> there's a problem. Um, so I think, I mean, Abelseth does seem, uh, to me, that was jaw. I could never figure out where it came from. Um, and then when I found out that Brillator hired him and, and could sort of trace him back, that is where it started. He, he started to tell the story in a, in a grander way. Interesting. Never let the truth get in the way of a good story. No, not, not, not with the Titanic. That is definitely uh, the, the, the real story is one of the, I think the great stories of the 20th century, but it has accumulated. Um, like there are two things that have su- suctioned onto the Titanic's wreck. One is the, um, the marine bacteria that's feeding on the wreck. And the other one is the, um, the myths and legends that are feeding on the truth, I think. And they're both barnacles growing off the ship. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think that was that was the one that was hardest to kind of um, research and delineate and say, look, this is not what happened. There is a reason why there was a higher um, casualty um, figure in third class. And there's about four reasons for it, not this one reason that Ibelsev put forward. Hmm. I suppose, yeah. it, it, again, it's like any story, the it simplified or it's, it, the, yeah. The, 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 it, yeah the the temptation is always to to simplify it and then and it, it loses all the nuance but the actual accuracy eventually it gets smoothed down so much that it's unrecognizable history like real life is messy mm. Mm. and so so brudator is responsible really for 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 a few of the myths, because not just through yep. Abel Seth, but Dorothy herself. So um, obviously with the with being a survivor, with already being a movie star, with being a movie star of the new film about being saved from the Titanic, she was interviewed a lot. And again, yep. her story became a little more embellished with the telling as well. Yep. So we've got a few myths we can attribute to her as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, so firstly, I should point out, Dorothy actually was the subject. He's one of the figures I look at in The Ship of Dreams. Mm -hmm. Dorothy was um, the subject of a really great biography by a historian called Randy Brian Bigham. And he is probably slightly more sympathetic than I am. He's excellent. I mean, his research is extraordinary. Um, And he talks a lot about, you know, kind of the pressure on on movie stars and the way certain things were um, massaged. I mean, he's he's excellent. Uh, for me, the the I uh, struggled with some of the, the people Dorothy was prepared to throw under the bus in her interview. Chief among them, um, the crew, and she and she really was. She did not miss them and hit the wall in her criticism of them. And uh, she she more or less. I mean, she did say that the reason there were so many female survivors was the heroism of the male passengers, not the crew. And she she sort of, she embellished a bit by saying that she you know she she talks about things in the interviews that she couldn't possibly have seen, um, because she left in the first lifeboat. Right. So there you know she talked that the steerage broke loose and carried everything before them in chaos. I'm like you were no you were you were rowing out to sea by that point, Dorothy. Um, so I think she she did. Um, she did contribute a, a fairly hyperbolic view of what happened into the public discourse. And part of that, you know, does seem to have been in her, not in her defense, but in mitigation, Dorothy was one of the early people that I came across who spoke in the language that we would associate with the, the golden age of Hollywood. That was, you know, she was on that first wave of celluloid celebrity mm. and she, talked in that kind of breathless um uh you would uh, like the old pathé newsreels of hollywood like all the stars are out and isn't everything divine she talked in a very uh kind of studio speak i think in her interview so i think part of the the dramatics that she shoehorned into her interviews was part and parcel with how she usually dealt with the media it's just that in the long term obviously her interviews about what happened on the titanic are considered the most historically significant ones she ever gave but it's interesting i mean and of course i suppose there have been words put in her mouth potentially by reporters wanting a lovely juicy you know, angle that that maybe someone else hasn't uh, hadn't done by that point. And she talked about, I think, in one of them, a great scramble for the lifeboats. Now, 
as you said, she's she was on one. She was on the first lifeboat, so she was already yeah. quite a way away from the ship. By because I, I, you talk about obviously the urgency just wasn't impressed upon um, upon the passengers to to get onto the lifeboats, which accounts wow. for some of the earlier ones being nowhere near full, of which she was uh, in one. So uh, this scramble for the lifeboats, one she wasn't there to see that but was there a scramble for the lifeboats at all ever at any point certainly towards the end when it when the dip the, the forward tilt of the ship as it began to sink um yes absolutely there were there were um allegations that they that gunshots may have been um fired into the air there certainly were incidents of uh, one officer threatening uh, just shoot the next man that charged the boat. So I think certainly, to, I mean, um, I think it's the it was the Hart family. They were in second class, and um, Benjamin Hart, um, when he moved his wife and his daughter, Eva Hart, who later went on, I think, to become a Tory councillor and a really eloquent um, memoirist of, of time of her time in the Titanic. He moved his wife and daughter over, and he had to say to the officer, "Look." I, don't shoot me I'm not trying to get in I'm just trying to help them in so I think there clearly was a scramble and it may be in Dorothy's defense actually she may simply have been replicating what she heard from other survivors on the Carpathia um, or from what the screams of panic that she heard um, from her own lifeboat but yes there, there definitely was at the end but Dorothy's case is as she said a really interesting point because uh, Dorothy was one of the very few first class passengers who was determined to get off the ship at the first available opportunity. And that was partly because um, her cabin, her and her mother's cabin was on E-deck. It was one of the cheaper cabins available in first class. And so the lower down you were on the ship, the more you were likely to have felt the the collision. And she does seem to have certainly felt something that indicated um, that a lot of, some first class passengers slept through it, slept through the collision. They were so high up uh, and, and midships. She certainly felt that she was walking back from uh, playing a game of bridge that had just finished when, it, when the ship hit the iceberg. So, and she also overheard a crew member uh, really early on, even before the lifeboats were uncovered, she heard a crew member say that they had seen water leaking in, leaking in to the first class squash court, which was a deck below her cabin. So I think what set her apart was that she knew, she was one of the very few first class passengers who knew that something was seriously wrong that early. And she, she walked into lifeboat seven, which was the first one to leave. And, but you know, she makes it very clear. Everyone in that boat made it very clear that they could not persuade passengers to get into them. They had no, the ship seemed so secure at this stage. And she, Dorothy probably um, saved the life, I think of her two, um, of her bridge partner, because she uh, got him to accompany her into the, into the lifeboat. And I think it, you know, so when she left, there was all sense of urgency was being stifled. No one was being told what had happened. Um, they had reopened the first class lounge. The band were playing waltzes and ragtime. Branty and Coco was being served. I mean, one passenger said looking around the first class lounge was like being in a fancy dress ball in Dante's Inferno because you could hear the the um, the engine screaming as, they, as steam erupted from below. But at the same time, some people were still in their dinnerware and some people were in uh, warm like promenade outfits and some had life jackets on and fur coats and it was just a slightly bizarre scene another passenger compared the early stages of the evacuation in first class to a boring picnic where you didn't know anyone and you just wanted to get away so there was so she left a point she was very lucky and i think probably shrewd that she did not let the uh, attempt to maintain normality trick her she knew what she had heard and she left as soon as she could Mm. I, I, they, I mean, as well, you talk about those, those people really um, sort of taking the mickey out of those getting into the lifeboats, like, mm. you know, oh, you'll be back soon or, you know, we'll see you for breakfast. Yeah. Um, the pressure not to get into the lifeboat seems to have been quite, we, quite we high. Have, 
yeah, I mean, when people saying things like, you're right, like, oh, you know, don't forget your ticket for when you come back in the morning. And, um, and even um, Colonel Astor, he was the richest man on board. The family were called the landlords of New York. That's how much of Manhattan they owned. And his wife, Madeline, was pregnant. And he, on several occasions, I mean, he did eventually get her into one of the later boats when he realized just how serious things were. But Astor, on at least two occasions, declined putting Madeline in a lifeboat because he thought the Titanic still felt so secure. The, the, the dip really didn't, the, the, note, the perceptible list forward into the ocean took a while to arrive. And so he, he thought the idea of putting his pregnant wife into a, into a small white lifeboat, luring her 70 feet into the pitch black Atlantic was an unacceptable risk. There's a, he, and even when um, he allegedly was offered the chance to go with her in some of the early ones, he said no and took her into the gymnasium and cut open a life belt to show her what was inside that made it buoyant. I mean, there was no sense of urgency. And part of that, I think looking back on, on the book, I, I wonder if I should have been a bit harder on Captain Smith um, because he really did not, the desire to avoid a panic was commendable, but he went f- too far in the opposite direction. I think in charity to him, he probably was in a state of severe shock, but he did not inform the crew that the ship was, uh, the um, hospitality, for want of a better word, the stewards and the stewardesses did not know it was sinking. So they didn't impart any urgency to the passengers. And so you had third-class passengers sitting in the general room, just waiting until they were told, until the, until they got more information. You had first-class passengers having a, a cup of hot chocolate in the lounge and listening to a concert. You had a lot of people who could have lived had the lifeboats been full and they would have gotten into them had they been told you need to. I suppose it's small mercy that it was a very still night. And, mm. that's, and so once they were in the lifeboats, freezing though that they were at least they weren't um dealing with rough seas at the same time and also i find this interesting because this this sort of harrowing is the fact that it was a it was a is it a new moon when you don't get any moonlight that night is that right so once the lights from the titanic itself had extinguished they were in the pitch black pitch black and that explains i mean sometimes you have to i think um sorry i'm doubling back on a sentence there but um in a lot of movies, particularly James Cameron's one, and even a lot of the, the television series versions, simply so that we, we as an audience can see it, the directors make the completely understandable decision to have the lights in the Titanic going at full strength until the last minute. But in fact, they did start to dip and dim at certain points. Uh, there were a lot of engineers from Belfast who sacrificed their lives to keep the power going for as long as possible. And they did really until about three or four minutes before it um, it sank, which is an extraordinary oh. thing. Um, and I, I mean, I find that bit so moving, just mm. very, very brave men. Um, but the lights actually were dimming bit by bit. And it meant that when they cut off, that explains why you have so many different testimonies from passengers that seem to, excuse me, survivors, that seem to have been describing seeing completely different things. Mm. You know, you have um, passengers saying it definitely did not split in two and other people saying it split in three and other people saying it, you know, and you think how on earth did you miss a 46,000 ton ship, the height of an 11 story building sticking into the night sky, splitting in two. Surely that's something that should have been obvious, but it was completely pitch black. Mm. And they were more go- they were more going on sound. And some people really close to it seem to have seen it snap. But for others, they could hear everything movable inside the Titanic, suitcases, beds, um, chairs, uh, things collapsing inside it. And in consequence of that, they confused the sound of it snapping. Sometimes it was just the sound of, of, of the ship kind of internally um, shedding all of its fittings. The noise must have been horrendous and to think of sitting in the dark as well I mean if you're in a lifeboat you're just sitting there listening to it but the, the no- if you were one of the ones left on the ship the noise the darkness I mean that's just so harrowing oh you have I mean the passengers some 
um, people who uh, escaped and the who jumped said that it was the closest thing they could they could compare it to was standing right underneath the railway bridge as a full industrial express train ran right across your head, like above your head. They said it was it. Uh, Colonel Gracie, who was a historian traveling in, in first class, said it, it was as if you every object you could imagine in a home being flung down the longest staircase you could imagine. And that's what it's, you know, I think the noise is something that you can't recreate, mm. but it, the auditory trauma that they suffered does mm. seem to have something that linked the passengers. I mean, even um, the Countess of Rothes tells a story that um, a year after uh, the sinking, she was, at, she was having dinner at the Ritz in London with a few friends and she all of a sudden felt this incredible uh, sense of um, cold. She says this cold settled over her that she associated with how cold she had been the night the Titanic sank and she couldn't understand why because she hadn't been thinking about the Titanic at all and then she realised that the Ritz's band was playing uh, a piece um, from the Tales of Hoffman and all of a sudden it came back to her that had been the last piece of music she heard um, after dinner on the last night of the Titanic and so I think the sounds in general really did seem to trigger what we would now recognise as PTSD in a lot of the survivors. I want to ask you a little bit more about there's two actual figures that you've you've mentioned that I want to go back to. We'll start with the Countess Rothes. Wow. Now she oh. I mean she runs through the book. She, she her she's just an incredible um lady but what um what struck me about her in the sort of the aftermath is her bravery in terms, I mean, she kept a brave face in order to help the other people on her lifeboat, even though inside she seemed, you know, she 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 had a really good grasp of the situation. Well, I think with her, and it was an interesting moment in research, and it's it's I I started out with no opinion opinion on the conscience of Rothes at all, really. Um, uh, I picked her because I needed an aristocrat to kind of explore what was happening to the aristocracy at the time. And I was left, through her words and crucially the words of others, I was left in complete awe of this woman. I mean, she was um, tough, but brave and kind and so thoroughly decent. She was a good person. Um, but I had initially, when I was doing the research on, on her experience in life book number eight, I had read the testimony of Thomas Jones, who was the able seaman in charge of it, and uh, Gladys Cherry, who was um, the Earl of Rothes' cousin, who also uh, was traveling on the Titanic. I hadn't read her account of it until after I'd read theirs. And the impression that they all have of her is that, you know, uh, the plucky little countess who uh, man the tiller and then help row for a few like hours on end and who uh, advocated going back to help those screaming in the water and who then led the lifeboat in Christian hymns to kind of keep their spirits up and then you read her account of it that she wrote um, to a historian in 1955 when she says that she felt like a ghost and that all she felt was total and complete despair. And um, that there was this sort of terrifying hopelessness and fear that was gnawing at her insides when they were in that lifeboat. And uh, she really downplays herself and then everyone else, you realize, I think to me that's the, I got very emotional reading it because I thought you have no idea what these other people have said about you, that that is not how you came across at all. You actually help these people, both in terms of keeping people's spirits up, but also in practical terms, you, you help row that lifeboat to safety. You help steer it. Um, so I think she was one person. I, I probably took a bit of inspiration from her. And she, you know, I think being active and being useful and trying to be a bit more useful to everyone around you, even if you feel a bit or very dodgy on the inside, is um, was something I just find utterly inspirational and extraor extraordinary to do it in that level of grief and trauma. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, she she would have had an impact on the the trauma that the other people would have felt. You know, she she cushioned them from 
it being even worse. Yes. And yet all the time she, she, cause she, she describes as well when it falls, the, the, when everything falls silent. So after this, the, the ship's gone. Oh, so we talked about the loud noise, but then there was this eerie silence once the ship had gone under um, and that the, she said the silence just felt full of the ghostliness of our feelings. Yeah. An incredible description. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was a bit, that's in that letter I was referencing yeah. uh, about, and that was her handwriting is, I, I was going through it and that just was one of those moments and a couple of them. And I wrote um, a biography of Catherine Howard, but, with this, it was one of those moments where I kind of jolted in the archives a bit with the, with just the the immediacy and the kind of horrible beauty of what she was describing. It was a ghostliness of our own feelings to describe the silence after is was oh extraordinary. Mm. How, how long were they in the boats before the Carpathia before they started? to be able to get onto yeah. the Carpathia? Well, there was sort of, um, there was, it depended. They, it took them, um, I mean, I think the Carpathia arrived less than two hours afterwards, but it it really took, until they got the last one, the, the, they were picking up lifeboats for about four, give or take four hours afterwards. So you had um, most of them, the overwhelming number of the lifeboats had a chance to see the dawn come up. And, and it's interesting you mentioned the weather. Yes, the Titanic sank on a night that was like a mill pond. That's a recurring comment that people say, just how calm it was. And to give it, and you're right, they're lucky the weather wasn't bad because the weather did turn at dawn. Yeah. And they start to feel, you know, some of them started to get seasick. And I think it is the Countess of Rothes. He says, you know, that um, as the weather turned, it just made you even more despondent. You, you were in waves and the, and the wind was hitting them. But they had a chance to see the sun come up over this field of icebergs and that that nearly broke a lot of their spirits as well. But if you if you had left in the first boat, I mean, the maximum you would have been in was six to seven hours. And that is still a very, very long time to be out completely exposed to the elements and you have people like um Dorothy Gibson who had who really was not who had grabbed a cardigan to go over her her dinner dress and she did need people did give her um uh, coats because she was freezing and that was a recurring problem um for a lot of people that they they said they were not dressed for this and some of them had pretty bad exposure i mean there was one young first class passenger who I, later went on actually become a, a champion at wimbledon in the u.s open but um the doctor in the carpathia wanted to amputate both his legs because of how badly damaged they were from exposure and he said you're no begged him not to and got up and walked in agony until he could prove he could keep using them yeah. um so you know i mean i think that was one of the things i tried to sort of really stress you know, a lot of people who uh, arrived in the Carpathia suffering not just from grief but from like the physical after effects of exposure hypothermia there was a couple I think there was um she might have been a second class no excuse me she was a third class survivor and she refused a bed because the only way she could um deal with the back pain that she had acquired that night was to lie like on the hard the the floor of the Carpathia and I you know some people with back pain they do need a really hard surface so there was a, a, what happened to them in the lifeboats was pretty horrendous in terms of not just the grief, but the physical impact. This is partly why I wanted to um, talk about the aftermath is the, the sort of the myths that came and how they came about. But also, um, you know, the, the story is kind of, there's, there's this, you know, when it's told in um, films or, or books or whatever, that, that there's this kind of crescendo to the sinking um, and then this bit is sort of, it, it, it's not, it's sort of lost, um, I, I feel, a, a bit, which is why I wanted to cover it. Um, now, you've also mentioned Captain Smith. Now, obviously, he's uh, famous f f for the, 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 with the image of him standing uh, at his post yeah. as the water, as he sort of goes into the water. Um, and there's... There's, in fact, I think you've named one of the chapters "Be British," um, and that's supposedly kind of his sort of instruction um, because he finally 
I think they, the timings of the, the the iceberg was hit some some time around twenty to midnight. I think is that right? And then he finally gave the um, instruction to abandon ship about two a.m., which actually is, I mean that's an incredibly short period when we talk about how yeah. normalized they were trying to keep the situation at the beginning. You realize how short the the evacuation time was. Um, let's talk about him then, and what what he said. And and how this evolved into this be this be British kind of feeling. Well, allegedly, I mean, there there are different accounts of what he said, and I and I say in the book, you know, some people say he he took the megaphone and shouted "Be British," and other people said he said "Abandon ship, every man for himself." It's possible he said both. I should point out there are quite a few historians who are fairly convinced that be British was a sort of patriotic um, myth made up afterwards and that he never said it at all. If he did say it, I don't think it actually necessarily needs to be read as um, uh, sort of... uh, what was it? I think Lord Charles Beriford, who, who who worked at the, it was high up in the British Navy, said, you know, that was, of course, one of the old sea dogs of the British Empire would have said. I don't think it needs to be read that way. Um, be British if he said it during the, the, the final uh, moments of the Titanic. Be British did kind of meant hold yourself together. Um it it it, it was the stiff upper lip. That's kind of what be British meant. Uh, it did, it didn't mean um, anything too jingoistic, or, or it, it was sort of shorthand for be decent, be calm, um, and don't panic. And but of course, in the aftermath of the sinking, it takes on this totemic importance of a sort of redemptive moment of patriotism. And it's the phrase is the one that appears on many of his memorial, I mean, most prominently, the most prominent memorial statue to him, I think in Litchfield it is. Um, ha- with his widow's permission, had that phrase put on the plinth. And so it, it it's interesting to see what people start to... Um, to use it for, and it really does take on such a huge patriotic significance in Britain. And and in a way, I think there was a redemptive moment of um, salvaging national pride after, you know, the largest ship in the world that flew the British flag had sunk on its maiden voyage, and that a British commander had been, had taken some of the navigational decisions that resulted in it hitting an iceberg. And so it, it became... A little bit like it's sort of that it's we see it in our, our myths a lot. First of all, Britain is uh, Britain loves to celebrate a good failure. Britain is very good at almost punishing the successful of its <laughs> of its sons and daughters sometimes, and and we love a Charles the First and we love a Captain Smith. The nobility of um, uh, a hero who embraces failure. You see, it runs away right the way back to like Achilles and Patroclus in. Trojan myth, there is that element with Smith that that what might have been a fairly prosaic instruction that basically meant don't panic and overwhelm um, an attempt to abandon ship with hysteria. If he did say it, then became something that was much more um, uh, significant and maybe more workaday intent behind it. Hmm. Do you think there was a bit of... Um tried to posthumously protect his character as well, because yes. as captain of the ship, it was going to be his I mean, name attached to the disaster. I, I mean, I felt the pressure. I felt guilty criticising him, which is ridiculous, um, because, I, you know, I, I felt, it felt like really bad form. I felt like I was kicking someone who had died, you know, um, bravely and undeservedly. Uh, and prematurely, but you only have to look at, you know, the slightly bumbling, lovely Santa Claus-esque figure that we're we're given time after time in Titanic movies, where he's almost like a secular saint, um, and he is the passive victim of circumstance, or the, the, the devil on his shoulder is Ismay, who survived. And um, I think Ismay became the whipping boy for all the bad decisions that were made by men who had died. And Smith did make uh, understandable, 
navigational decisions in the build-up. You know, when he he did not take the iceberg warnings as a reason to slow the ship. Um, that was fairly in, in keeping with standard nautical practice at the time. But he he did make really questionable decisions after the iceberg. You know, there, there was a lot of delay uh, that, that I'm sure was the result of shock. There was a complete breakdown in command. Smith is curiously absent from the evacuation narratives of a lot of passengers. There's a lot more reference of Chief Officer Wild, First Officer Murdoch, Second Officer Lightoller, in fact, all of the officers except Smith. There's very few times. Um, the Countess of Rothes really briefly says he came up to her and said, you know, dress warmly and come on deck. George Bernard Shaw was the one person who said the way Smith is being written about is the way we write, we talk about Lord Nelson and sort of, you know, great military naval heroes. And he, George Bernard Shaw, to anyone who knows his plays, was, was not um, short on acid um, in terms of his opinions. And he said, I just realised short on acid sounds like I imply he was taking a drug. Short on acidic temperament. Uh, short on acidic temperament. And he said, Smith... Um, captained a ship that was going too fast into a dangerous zone, and he paid for that consequence with his life. I think as a lot of Shaw's stuff, that's a little bit harsh, but I, I, you did feel that there was a concerted effort. I think from a good place of motivation, by the way, I think people didn't want to, you know, exacerbate the grief of his widow and daughter. Mm. Um, and they felt it was poor form to, to, to malign the dead. But the unfortunate consequence, I think, of the... Um, sort of secular canonization of Edward Smith was the complete evisceration of Bruce Ismay, who again did make, certainly did make mistakes, but the sheer level of opprobrium that was heaped on his head um, was astonishing. I mean, the vitriol was just absolutely brittle. Mm. And I do think that was because they needed someone to blame that wasn't Smith. And of course, Ismay made the uh, error of surviving, which yeah. made him the nice target. You you, you don't uh, badmouth a, a dead man when there's a live one oh, you, to pin. You, it's, it's odd form. You're right. Ismay's greatest mistake was that he lived. That was, you know, I actually find him quite bumbling and uh, very awkward. I, I find him, I'm honest, I, I, I have no, I would have no interest in being next to Bruce Ismay at a dinner party. Um, you know, he could be both quite arrogant and very awkward and sort of theatrically self-critical at times. I mean, that was really something that, from his letters that, that shocked me about him. But he was very much... Um, uh, he did not interfere with how that ship was navigated. That is not that was not his sort of modus, and I do think that. Fun, uh, I mean, he he did say some pretty tone deaf things afterwards. He he did not help himself, but this sort of malign, like vulpine villain that he's been cast as repeatedly is just ridiculous. And I do think that's because he survived. Was he the only one to be demonized or what did other people i'm thinking i suppose i'm thinking particularly men there was always yeah. a, a big um focus and ever since on the idea that women and children should have been saved before right. the men so what was it like for the male survivors afterwards not horrendous it was not great there were some I mean, so jack thayer here right about he was the son of a sort of railway tycoon if you want to for ease of reference and it, but he jumped and Algernon Barkworth who was a, um, a landowning first class passenger from Yorkshire jumped Colonel Gracie jumped light alert jumped so they were not uh, criticized for having survived because they hadn't taken a space in the lifeboat but if you look at uh, the only Japanese survivor of the Titanic who was traveling in second class was um, I mean his life was just hounded. I mean, he was really mocked and ostracized when he made it home safely to Japan because he'd left in a lifeboat. And for a long time, there was this sort of slightly smug Anglo-American tradition of saying that 
that was proof of the the um, survival of the samurai tradition in in Japan, and that death was honorable death was more uh, preferable than honorable dishonorable survival. But that's not true. You only need to look at what was done to the British and the Canadian and the American male survivors as well. I mean, there's still the number of times. I mean, the first class male survivors were accused of having dressed as women in order to kind of take a place. A major, um, Arthur Putchin, who was a Canadian um, and a yachtsman who was told by an officer when they realized they hadn't put enough seamen in a lifeboat, if you can get down that rope and into the lifeboat, will you help um, with the, the, the navigation of it? He's still referred to in certain parts of Canada as the, he dressed as a woman. Uh, his business was destroyed, you know, his business was all but destroyed by this. And it started, it really started on the um, on the Carpathia. Uh, Margaret Brown, who everyone sort of remembers by her modern nickname of Molly Brown, said that male survivors had started there and then, just when it became clear how many people had died, they'd almost started to apologise for living. And there were so many different ways you could, you could jump. There were, t- there were some officers that let men in. Um, there were multiple ways that men survived that did not imply that they had elbowed women and children out of the way. And also, there simply were more men on the ship than women and children. So it, it but obviously in the aftermath of, of such collective trauma, people are kind of looking around for someone to blame. And, and not all the passengers behaved uh, well. Alfred Nurney, who was a car salesman pretending to be a German baron, but traveling in first class, like he, he tried to commandeer all the blankets that were to be used to cover other survivors as a mattress for himself. And until another, I think a woman from either first or second class, like caught the pile of blankets and flipped him up and said, you know, it's a disgrace that good men and women and children die, but you lived. And I think well, he was a heinous person. Mm. But, um, but I think there was a general feeling of, as it became clear that there had been children that died and that there had been women, it, it it just seemed, with how contem- they viewed contemporary morals, that that it was it was wrong for men to have survived. That was the general feeling. Mm, that must have been an awful roller coaster of emotions for those those men as well. And in fact, Jack, who you mentioned, he 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 ended up he was one of the ten survivors who who committed yeah. suicide in the years following. Um, which just goes to show the level of trauma that was left with with survivors. Yeah, it it was lacerating, and I think sometimes you know we see that with people that, that survive terrible things. That and even you know, not to directly equate them, but people who've been severely bullied or people who've been in, in, in you know pretty severely abusive upbringings or relationships. Sometimes there is a long delay. Um, between them enduring the abuse and, and the end of, of that dynamic and then, and then the full uh, almost grieving and healing and horror process hits later. There is a delayed reaction, I think, to grief and trauma. And that did happen with a lot of the Titanic survivors. Um, you mentioned the signs. I mean, Annie Robinson, who'd been working in the Titanic as a stewardess, she was... A couple of years later, emigrating to uh, Massachusetts, I think, um, to join her daughter. And one night, the ship she was on, the Devonian, hit fog. And the ship's whistle and fog horn and, um, starts sounding. And she sort of quite un- walked up on the deck and threw herself overboard. You know, there there are there are really. Um, I, I think the line I used. To the, so the epigraph for the last chapter was from um, Joseph Conrad that, you know, in the lives of those born under the shadow of death, there's often a shadow of madness. And I think that it, that did happen for a lot of them. It, it, it was their survivor's guilt is, is, always, is often a thing as well. Why did I live when so many died? And in Jack's case, he saw a friend drawing right in front of him, you know, there was, and, and his father, um, well, his whole family life was destroyed by it. So I think, you know, of course, there is absolutely uh, a sense that the night, the night endured for long after the rescue. Mm. 
it's it, it's an incredible story um and I have to really con- I mean all your books are amazing but I have to congratulate you on this one it was I actually listened to it to the audible version um and, and then got got the got the book as well um Jenny, who does that Jenny did who's the narrator she isn't she brilliant she's amazing yeah. yeah she did my she did the audiobook for young and damned and fair which is um a book i did in, um uh, Catherine howard and she was I, I love her voice i'm so glad she could do this one as well it, she, it's it's yeah it's very obviously your writing and and her voice makes it it's a very very um engaging uh listen uh, and, and read i like doing both i like getting the audible and then getting the book and i follow, I just, I, follow on I'm really getting into audible books recently like i'm it's i love them and i never used to i don't know what's sort of shifted but i love them yeah it's it's a great way of of um of, of, of getting more books read actually in my in my opinion <laughs> but it's, it's 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 it is an incredible book so your research is obviously so thorough um I, I don't think there are there are, there are other you know amazing historians, but your your level of research seems to be beyond um, uh, beyond many, and the way you weave so many themes in because of course life is that complex, and you but you get that over um, even back to you know what was happening in Belfast at the time of the construction and things like that it was it's fascinating I feel like I've learned so much like I said I could I could read it a hundred times and I think I'll still be picking up new you know new things that 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 I can you know sit in my brain rather than just float through um so thank you ever so much I think we we could we could talk all day and I definitely would like you to to come back and and talk about other other parts um and and you know, also at, at some point about your Young and Damned and Fair biography of Catherine Howard, which again is an incredible book. Um, and of course, we are hoping um, in 2022 to invite or whatever <laughs> the right word, 20 or so people on our Titanic tour as well. Yes. Which, is, which should have been before that, but you know, life is life and, and we adapt. Um, so um, where we're going to be looking we're obviously going to have four or so days where we're going to be able to look into the story of the Titanic in 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 all its detail glory and gore um sure. yeah, like glory and gore nice <laughs> <laughs> it, it's I mean it's, it's some of the, the stories they are harrowing but I think this is where you know this is I like to unpick things because the Titanic has been glamorized and the 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 disaster of it has been has been glamorized which is you know that's the case with so many sure. things yeah, isn't it um and um yeah so the what happened next I find I find that really interesting because it, it was something that stuck with point. these people definitely the most difficult but you're right and we've searched for the by a long shot I think I might actually have mentioned it to you at the time um or just after I was like this is just absolutely. tough going yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, I imagine. I imagine it must have been. But thank you so much for writing the book. I think it's an incredible resource for everyone interested in the Titanic. Yeah, thank you very much. Very well. Thank you. Thank you for joining me. Thank you.